All rise. The Honorable Vernellis K. Armstrong, Judge of the United States District Court. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable District Court of the United States for the Western Division of the Northern District of Ohio is now open for the transaction of business pursuant to adjournment. All persons having business before this Honorable Court will draw nigh, give attention, and ye shall be heard. God save the United States of America and this Honorable Court. Distinguished members of the platform party, Judge Armstrong, Congressman Latta, friends and family, good afternoon and I welcome you to the University of Findlay. On behalf of President Catherine Fell, the entire faculty and staff and the students of the University of Findlay, I bid you warm welcome on this beautiful and auspicious day. My name is Darren Fields, I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs, and it is truly an honor to be here today to welcome you to the campus of the University of Finley as we host this occasion of your becoming citizens of the United States of America. We're proud to serve as the host location for this ceremony, and we are pleased to be able to celebrate and share your day with friends and family around the world by video streaming. In this way, we hope that the arms of our campus extend outward to you as the arms of our nation on this important occasion. I wish you all the very best of fortune and happiness in your new lives as American citizens. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Fields for your warm welcome to the university. And thank you, Ms. Terry, for a very professional opening of court. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I preside today on behalf of and bring greetings to you from all the judges of the Northern District of Ohio Western Division, and especially from David A. Katz, who is a native of Fenley and very proud to be a native of Fenley. We express great appreciation to Dr. Darren Fields, Vice President for Academic Affairs, and the Dean and faculty and the University of, of Finley for again hosting this spectacular ceremony. We are just always so impressed by the presentation of colors. It is a magnificent way to begin the ceremony. We are privileged to hold this ceremony in the award-winning Kohler Fitness and Recreation Complex. This complex was recognized last year by the ASBA Architects as an outstanding indoor multi-purpose facility. And today is an example of one of the many special occasions which the center accommodates. It is a great privilege and an honor to greet the 20 applicants for citizenship, their families and friends. And as a footnote, I should tell you that one person scheduled to appear this morning has already been granted her citizenship as she had a pressing appointment elsewhere. So there were originally 21 new citizens today, but one citizen has already received her citizenship papers. The happiness and excitement of this day, we hope, will remain a vivid memory for the remainder of your lives. The decision to become a citizen of the United States is a decision which we're sure you made after long and careful consideration. And speaking for those of us who already possess American citizenship, we applaud your decision. We believe that it is a good one, as this country clearly represents the land of freedom and continues to strive for equality for all. The United States has a long history of welcoming immigrants from all parts of the world. And as, a, and as an example, during the past decade, about 6.6 .6 million persons were naturalized. To make this ceremony 
very, very special. We have many outstanding and wonderful guests. It is also my pleasure to introduce some of our special guests. Their presence emphasizes the importance of this occasion. I ask that each guest please stand after you're introduced and we will save our applause until all of the guests have been introduced. Today we are privileged to have as keynote speaker the Honorable Robert Latta, U.S. Congressman, 5th Congressional District, and I will have more comments about Representative Latta later. He is accompanied by a member of his staff, Andrew Lorenz. Is, is he present? A substitute? All right, thank you. We are also privileged to have a representative of the office of Senator Rob Portman, and she is here today. Thank you very much. Linda Greenwood appears on behalf of Senator Portman. He has been a senator since 2011. We also have representatives of the DAR. The DAR consists of members whose ancestors fought in the American Revolution and helped in achieving American independence. The organization is a nonprofit group that works to promote historic preservation, education, and patriotism, and has chapters in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Chapters have also been founded in countries outside the United States. The DAR is represented today by five chapters, and I would ask that you please stand, the representative please stand, the Fort Industry Chapter, represented by Beverly St. Clair, the Lucy Walcott Barnum Chapter by Debbie Duchesne, the Fort Finley Chapter by Regent Martha Avery, Dasami Curry, Gay Jones, Sandra Smith, Shirley DeRay, Patricia Stasilowski, the Lima Chapter by Nancy Clark, the Ursula Wolcott Black Swamp Chapter by Regent Rosemary Bursell. Four outstanding high school seniors from Fenley, Arcadia, Arlington, and Riverdale High Schools. Mr. Bowden Fisher, Mr. Mikhail Kiefer, Mr. Dexter Wilson, and Miss Samantha Walter. And their very proud parents, if they are present today, we would ask you to stand as well. Miss Virginia Small of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Ms. Sandra Akins kruger who is our guest soloist today, Dr. Fields, who has welcomed us, and of course, Christine Terry. There are other special guests who will be recognized during the ceremony. However, at this time, I would like to ask Dr. Marie Loudon Haynes, Dean of Undergraduate Education, to please stand as we thank her and her staff for their time and energy in making this program so outstanding. She does it year after year, and we are just always thrilled to accept her invitation to come here. At this time, let us all give our special guests a special round of applause. And I am just reminded, as is always the case when you're introducing special guests, that you omit some very important person, which I have just done. And I just omitted Johnny Taylor of the League of Women Voters. I would ask her to please stand. And I apologize to you because your role is so important in that of the League of Women Voters. And one of the things that we all emphasize, and that's the importance of voting as an American citizen. So let's give Ms. Johnny Taylor a special <laughs> round of applause. Thank you. And now we are privileged to have and to hear the beautiful voice of our mezzo-soprano, Ms. Sandra Egan's Kruger. I would ask you all to please stand as she sings the national anthem. <laughs> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming 
whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red gleam, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, see, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Thank you so much, Ms. Cooker. You may now be seated. And now, one of the most important persons to appear today is Ms. Virginia Small, who will make the INS presentation. Thank you, Your Honor. an officer of the Citizenship and Immigration Services and interviewed the 20 candidates that are here to become citizens today, and we therefore recommend that they be administered the oath of allegiance and become naturalized citizens and any petition for name changes be granted. Thank you very much. The court would like a moment to review the petition. The court has reviewed the petition and finds it to be in proper order, and I will grant the request. And I would also add, Ms. Small, I'm sure you're the most popular person here today. At this time, I would ask our new citizens to please stand, raise your right hand, so that the oath of allegiance can be administered to you. I will read the oath and ask for your declaration I do at the end of the oath. Please listen carefully to the oath. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or a citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law, and that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. Please say, I do. Did all 20 new citizens say, I do? Is there anyone who could not say, I do? I hear no responses, so I assume that all 20 said, I do. You are hereby declared citizens, and you may return to your seats. Thank you very much. I ask you to sit down, and then we're just going to ask you to stand again because Mr. Lucas Operman, who is Vice President of the University of Finley Student Government Association and a senior here at the university, will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I would ask everyone to now please stand, and we will have the Pledge of the Allegiance. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, please place your right hand over your heart and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, 
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will have another special solo from Ms. Kruger. Beautiful the spacious skies For amber waves of grain For purple mountain majesties Above the fruited plain America, America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Thank you so much, Ms. Krieger, for adding your beautiful voice to this ceremony. We are privileged this afternoon to have Congressman Robert, known as Bob Latta, as guest speaker for the naturalization ceremony. As applicants for citizenship, the new citizens have studied the American form of government, and they've learned about the three branches of government, the executive, the judicial, and the legislative. So today, we have Congressman Latta representing the legislative branch. He is currently serving his fourth term in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction on legislative matters, including energy policy, telecommunications, food and drug safety, public health research, and interstate and foreign commerce. That's a big assignment. <coughs> he is also a member and vice chair of the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology. He serves on several other subcommittees and has a host of other roles and responsibilities in the U.S. House of Representatives. Before his election to Congress, Congressman Latta was a member of the Ohio House of Representatives for six years, the Ohio Senate for three years, and was a Wood County Commissioner for six years. While in Congress, Representative Latta has received many honors and much recognition. This year, Congressman Latta was honored by the Healthcare Distribution Management Association with the Prescription Safety and Leadership Award for his leadership and commitment to advancing policies that enhance patient safety and security of the pharmaceutical distribution supply. Congressman Latta is active in, Bowl in his Bowling Green community where he is a member of the Bowling Green Kiwanis, Chamber of Commerce, and the Wood County Farm Bureau. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Bowling Green University, and I am pleased to announce that he received his law degree from the University of Toledo. Let's give Congressman Lada a big round of applause. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to be with you all today, and I, I've been apologizing about my voice. The cherry blossoms went into bloom last week in Washington, and my allergies immediately came back. But it is really an honor to be here, and first of all, to congratulate all of our 20 new United States citizens. Uh, I can't think of a greater honor in the world than every time that we stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance, to make an allegiance to our flag and to our country, and I welcome you as citizens of these great United States. One of the things that I really enjoy is I get to go out to a lot of schools. And I just spoke at a school in my district this past week. And I spoke to juniors and seniors. And one of the things we, they asked me to talk about, surprisingly, is about government. And one of the things, though, I think it's really unique is to have so many students here today. 
Because in America, you know, a lot of people might take what we have for granted. But there are so many people that want this privilege to raise their hand and take that oath of citizenship to our great land. So for all of you that are here as students, and when you think about when you're in government classes and your responsibilities, it's important. And you know, we are all pretty much, you can say, a, a nation of immigrants. This is my dad's home county. Now the Lattice kind of worked their way in from Pennsylvania into Ohio in like in the late 1790s, early 1880, 1800s. My mom's family comes from about 35, 40 miles from here, over in Putnam County, between Pandora and Columbus Grove. And they all came over in that great immigration back in the 1840s. The one side was French, the other side's German over there. But they worked their way over, and you know, those folks did the same thing. They came to this country with a dream. And what was that dream? You know, for some people, they thought that, you know, they wanted to get away from the Bonapartes and the Kaisers and everyone else that were sending them off to war. They were being told their homelands that they couldn't own property. They couldn't get ahead. They had nothing for their families for the future. But we have a, a great, unique opportunity. And you think about those people back in those days. You know, they got on old rickety sailing ships. You didn't know if that thing was going to make it out of the harbor before it sank. And I always said that, you know, a lot of uh, people's ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Most of ours came over on the Poor Flower. But it comes right down to it, there was a desire to have something different. And that desire was to have a freedom. A freedom that would give people the opportunity to live free. An opportunity to go out and make a living. To own property, to go out and clear land on a farm, you know, to go out and cut those trees down, plow those fields by t behind a team of horses. But it was that also that unique idea that they were doing something else. It just wasn't about them, it was about their families and the future families. And that's one of the things that our founding fathers also thought about. I'm a student of history. I was a history major in college, and when I get to fly back and forth on the plane every week, that's my one hour on both ways I get to read. And when I work out early in the morning, that's my other hour. But it's usually, it's always about history. But one of the unique things that we fail to look at a lot of times in our history, because, you know, a lot of times we live in a world today that's instant. You know, it's uh, instant coffee. It's the microwave. It's instant dinner. But this country wasn't founded on something that was instant. When you think about you know, the discovery by Columbus in 1492, or the settlement at Jamestown in Virginia, or the Mayflower going into Massachusetts, it was not over a few days or a few months or a few years, but over centuries of where we are today. And when you think about back that nobody really gave this country a chance in 1775 because the, and the day after tomorrow, there's a date in history you might remember. It's April the 18th, 1775. It was the day that Paul Revere rode with Prescott and Dawes. And they didn't go out to the countryside and say that the British were coming or the British are coming. They were out to do, they said that the regulars were out. The regulars are out. They do two things. One, to arrest the patriot leaders. Two, to confiscate their powder. Because the British knew without both of those things, maybe they could nip something in the bud. But when they rode that night, the countryside heard it. They came to that call. Because on April the 19th, 1775, a small band of patriots stood upon Lexington Green, and when they were commanded to stand down, lay down their arms and go home, they stood. To this day, no one knows who fired that first shot, but it was a shot that was heard around the world and started a revolution. And it didn't end in a day or a week but in grueling, grueling years. No one thought it had a chance, but a handful of patriots did. And they persevered until there was a surrender 
at Yorktown in 1781 by Cornwallis. Things didn't get, you know, instant. We didn't have instant government. We had a failed policy of something called the Articles of Confederation that was started. They tried to get put together in 1778. It wasn't really ratified by all the states until 1781, but it didn't work. James Madison looked at it. He was a student of not only government, but of knowing what history is and should be into the future and said, we need to all get back together. So they met at Annapolis, and later at that conference, they said, you know what, we need to really all get together again. And so it was in May of 1787 that they assembled in Philadelphia. They invited all the 13 states to come. Rhode Island didn't show up. But there was a handful of individuals there that went there knowing that something had to be done to create a better form of government. And it didn't just happen overnight again. It started in early May and ended on the 17th of September. Some people got mad and went home. Some people said, well, you know what, this isn't working, but then they finally came back. But it was through compromise and hard work that they finally came up with the greatest document that man has produced, the Constitution. Now, it's not always, you can say, it's perfect, because that's why they said, you know what, we have to have the ability to amend it. And then they said, we also have a bill, need a Bill of Rights. Madison, who people considered as the father of the Constitution, they didn't think we really needed a Bill of Rights, because he said, well, it says it right there, what the federal government can do. Because one of the things that you all know as new citizens is that the preamble of the Constitution says where the power of the government comes from. And it's we, the people which was unique because it wasn't the government saying where these are the rights and privileges that you're going to have, but it's the people telling the government what the government was going to have. When uh, Franklin left that day, he met a woman on the uh, steps. And when she asked Benjamin Franklin, wanted to know what kind of government had they conceived for the people. And he said this, a republic if you can keep it if you can keep it he wasn't just talking about her and the people in Philadelphia that day but about a country and its citizens into the future because this country has gone through you know a lot of tough times not just a revolution you know we're celebrating the 200th anniversary from 1812 to 1815 of the War of 1812. You know, a lot of people don't realize that the British captured Washington in August of 1814 and burned it. They burned the Capitol. They burned the White House. Our national anthem comes from Baltimore when Francis Scott Key watched the bombardment by the British of the fort, but it held. We went, you know, the trials and tribulations got tough. We had a civil war, over 750,000 lives lost. But we came back together as Americans. So, as mentioned a little bit earlier about voting, why it's so important. Because our forefathers and ancestors also looked into that future and saw this, that for this great land to work, it's just not saying, I want someone else to do it for me. I've got to participate. And participating means voting. And for many of these new citizens here today, maybe in their own countries, you know, when I see across the globe where people for the first time get to vote and they're getting shot at, hand grenaded, they're going to say they'll be executed if they, anybody's be found with a purple mark on their thumb showing that they couldn't vote twice, but they've already voted. But they're proud to show it. We need to do that in this country. We need to participate in the greatest experiment the world has ever known in freedom. I just want to thank you all for making that pledge to our country, for wanting to become American citizens, because this is the greatest country in the world, and it's ours 
to not only protect and defend, but to pass on to the future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Lada, for those very meaningful remarks and for a history lesson for our new citizens. They were very excellent remarks. Thank you so much. And, and if it's necessary for you to leave, we certainly understand. We're just delighted that you took time from your very busy schedule to include us and to participate in this very impressive ceremony because our new citizens will have something very special to say as they talk about their naturalization. Thank you so very much. There is a great concern in our country today that perhaps we're not teaching enough government, there aren't enough civic classes, and that our students aren't learning enough about American history. Well, today we have four students who will refute that allegation. They're going to talk to you about the responsibilities and duties of citizenship, and we're so proud of them. They're seniors, and we know that they'll go on to college and accomplish many great things once they have finished. I'd like to introduce all of them, and they will come up one at a time and uh, give their comments. I would also ask that if their parents are present, would you please stand uh, when your son or daughter is introduced? Because parenting is so important, and these young people would not be outstanding without your support and encouragement. And so we applaud the parents as well as the students. Bowden Fisher is a senior at Finley High School and the son of Brad and Holly Fisher. Bowden will be attending the Ohio State University in the fall to pursue a double major in economics in either political science or journalism. Mikhail Kiefer is a senior at Arcadia High School and the son of Ann Stahl and Jim Kiefer. Mikhail plans to attend either the Air Force Academy or enlist, or enlist and attend college on the base. Mikhail is involved in many activities in school, as well as community, and also holds a private pilot's license. So that's something I'd like to chat with you about uh, after the ceremony, because I too have a private pilot's license. Dexter Wilson is a senior at Arlington High School and the son of Bob and Jenny Wilson. Dexter will be attending Wayne State University in the fall, majoring in chemical engineering. To his many other credits, Dexter is a two-year member of the Arlington National Honor Society. He also enjoys sports and volunteering. Dexter, you and I have something in common because I am also a graduate of Wayne State University and the Wayne State University Law School. I was not smart enough to major in chemical engineering, so good luck to you. Thank you. Samantha Walter is a senior at Riverdale High School and the daughter of Bradley and Lisa Walter. Samantha will begin her studies at the Agricultural Technical Institute of the Ohio, of the Ohio State University in Worcester, Ohio, before transferring to the main campus in Columbus to complete her degree in agronomy with a minor in agricultural business. How terrific. Let's give these students a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> round of applause. And we would now like to hear from Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Your Honor. There are many things about being American that cannot be described except by one's inner revelations and personal experiences. In your time here, you must all have felt this or you would not have taken the monumental step that you did today. I congratulate you in this and hope for your prosperity here. However, your journey has only begun. As you drive from one end of this continent to the other, from sea to sea, it is evident that we are not a homogeneous people in ethnicity, in religion, or in thought. However, we share the belief that all people are entitled to life, 
liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One of the places our freedom is most observable is in the voting booth, which I was able to use for the first time this year. It was the absence of anything spectacular that astonished me. There were no parades, no banners, and no armed force or militants to influence me. The only thing brought into that building was my opinion. As I viewed the issues on which I was able to voice my opinion this year, I realized it was merely a few members for school board, a township treasurer, and other seemingly trivial matters that were left me to decide. Then I realized that these really were of utmost importance. It's not the presidential election or the Supreme Court decisions that define America. It is we the people who function every day, who work, volunteer, run organizations, and drive down Main Street. We must realize that every decision we make is important. As Americans, we are given the opportunity to make ourselves heard. Some great minds, such as Thomas Hobbes, came to believe that people are incapable of governing themselves. However, here we have proved them wrong for over 225 years. We may not all live in the White House, run the State House, or work in the courthouse, but what we do with our lives influences others and our society. And it is true that we have the freedom of speech, right to petition, freedom of religion, and many other enumerated rights and benefits living in a world superpower. However, our country is simply a conglomeration of individuals who have decided that this is the best place to live. The United States is what we make it, and that is the freedom we possess, to define a country and what it stands for. According to Thomas Jefferson, it is simply this, the care of human life and happiness and not their destruction is the first and only legitimate object of good government. Your addition to our citizenry and your devotion to freedom will allow us to continually and confidently hope, as President Abraham Lincoln did in 1863, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. Hello. My name is Michael Kiefer. I'm a senior at Arcadia High School. And like the judge was talking, I am a private pilot. I'll have to catch up later. Um, and today, I'm here to talk about just what these new citizens have done to become a citizen of these great United States. They had to take a test in an interview, and we take this for granted. We learn all of these things in government class and civics class, but a few of these questions some Americans might not know. So today, we're going to play a little game for a part of my speech called Who Wants to Be a Citizen? I encourage your anticipation. I'm going to ask a couple questions that were in the interview and on the test. And if any of you know, raise your hands so we can get an idea of how many of you know what these guys know. All right. I looked up these questions online from a government site that has listed all of the questions to practice. And the first question is, what are two cabinet-level positions underneath the president? Who knows this answer? That's not a lot of hands. Are you guys being honest? See? Looky here. I'm sure most of these guys have studied this. And one of the answers is any of the secretaries, Secretary of Agriculture, Commerce, Defense, Education, the State, etc. Um, the Attorney General and the Vice President. All of those positions are cabinet positions. The second question is that there are four amendments to our Constitution which change who is allowed to vote and describe one. How many of you guys could do that? Okay, there's some more hands. That's nice. All right. Um, some of these amendments were that citizens only had to be 18 to vote, that there was no poll tax, that women could vote, and that men of any race could vote. All right, my third and last question for today is that there are two ways Americans can participate in democracy. Well, there's more than two, but name two is the question. How many of you guys can name two ways that we can participate in our democracy? Wow. What about voting? That's my next topic. We can all vote. 
And I encourage each and every one of you to please vote. Like Bob Latta said and all of the speakers before me, voting is the foundation upon which our great country is based. And I encourage you to use that right and privilege that you all now have to influence the future of our country. What next? Now that you're all citizens, which has obviously been a very long and studious journey for you, and I congratulate and commend every one of you. Next, like I said, you can vote, you can obtain an education, and you can be active in your community and participate in any way in our great democracy that we have today. I would like to say thank you for choosing America and coming to participate in our wonderful democracy and hope each and every one of you the best because it took courage, determination, and dedication to become a citizen here. And those traits define you as individuals and ensure that you will be successful in whatever you do. Thank you. I know in the program it says Dexter is next, but I'm not Dexter. My name is Samantha Walter, and I am from Riverdale High School. And I came to talk about the journey that it took for all these people to come and become a citizen. My first question is, how long did it take the majority of us to travel here today? A half hour, maybe an hour tops? These small miles and the short amount of time traveled is nothing compared to the thousand of miles and hours of traveling that has been completed by the men and women and their families that we have gathered to celebrate their tremendous achievements today. From the Philippines to the United Kingdom and from Jamaica to Mexico and many places in between, the average miles traveled is 5,287 miles. About the same distance if we were to take a trip starting here in Finley, Ohio and going to the Grand Canyon in Arizona, then to Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, visiting the St. Louis Arch in Missouri, going to New York to visit the Statue of Liberty, experiencing the magic of Disney World in Florida, and then traveling back here. These miles may be great, but the obstacles they have overcome are greater. The goals they have accomplished are far higher. And the reason that they're here today to celebrate their accomplishment by becoming a citizen of this great country, the United States of America, is the greatest. Les Brown said, your goals are your roadmaps that guide you and show you what is possible for your life. You have all reached your goals, and now the doors have been opened to endless pos possibilities. Congratulations to you all. I welcome to you, you to the United States of America, and may God bless everyone. Thank you. Hello, I am Dexter Wilson, and I'm from Arlington High School. I'm going to talk about here in America. First off, only let me wish a sincere congratulations for all the new citizens sitting here today. We are all excited for you. The story of America began in the eventful year of 1776, when 56 brave delegates wanted something greater, something full of liberty and freedom from Great Britain's wrath. Now. Every year since then, the same is true for any new citizen of the United States. They want something greater, something with freedom and liberty. That is why citizens choose our wonderful country today, to start something new, with nothing stopping them from achieving their goals. All of us in this room today know that USA stands for the United States of America. But what does that mean? It means that people come together to become something better, something outstanding, something united. It means that people can do whatever they want and can have freedoms that others wish to have. It means having faith in our government, in our citizens, and in our lands. Being a citizen of the United States is not just about being free. It's about being a drain of sand on a beach that together can make sand tassels, but at the same time can still be unique and on its own if it chooses to be. Sometimes the smallest benefits of being a part of this great country 
are the ones that we take the most for granted. This is why the United States is greater for these citizens sitting in front of you today. G stands for government freedom. R stands for rights. E stands for everyone united. A stands for attending anything you want. T stands for taking college classes. E stands for entering into a new life. And R, realizing America is the best place to live in this world. Something greater, something new. They chose America. Thank you, and God bless everyone in this room. Thank you, students, for representing the world of tomorrow so well. I have been inspired, awed by your comments, your imagination, and each of you took a different approach, which was very impressive, and they were all equally excellent. If there is such a phrase as equally excellent, you were. And so I also want to recognize, if they're here, your high school teachers and principals, because those people who think that we're not teaching civics in high school haven't met you, obviously, because you're very knowledgeable and have a great sense of maturity in your approach to the government. And I feel relieved knowing that the world of tomorrow will be led by persons such as the speakers who have just talked to us. Thank you very, very much. And now I would just like to welcome the new citizens. It's a great privilege to be among the first persons to gr congratulate you as new American citizens. As our speakers have said before, our country is indeed a great one. And they have all talked briefly about the rights and privileges and responsibilities of citizenship. I encourage you to, uh, to participate in our government, to exercise our cherished right to vote. I think everyone has talked about the right to vote because it is so basic. It's your voice in our government. Don't take it for granted. Exercise it. Use it. Our government is also the best in the world. And so I encourage you to continue to learn about it. I know that you studied and worked hard to learn the basics about our government. But keep learning. Keep listening. Learn all that you can about our system of government and how it works. And one invitation that I would like to give to you is if you get a letter from the court system inviting you to serve on jury duty, please accept that invitation. It's so important. This gives you another opportunity to learn about American government. You can learn about the court system and how it works. And certainly, if you were to be involved in a court case, wouldn't you want to have a juror like yourself sitting on the jury, someone who is open-minded, fair, will listen to the evidence, and reach a fair decision? This is a really important obligation of citizenship. So when you get a letter from the court asking you to report on a certain day for jury duty, don't throw it away. Don't say, I don't want to do this. It's an exciting and wonderful responsibility. You'll learn more and more about our system. I encourage you to become familiar with our national and local treasures by visiting our nation's capital and other interesting and historic cities, our parks. Learn all that you can about your new country. And finally, I welcome you into the mosaic or the melting pot known as America. It's our diversity, our difference, that makes this country strong. And I encourage you to become an active and contributing citizen. 
because of your heritage and ethnic background, you have much to share. We ask that you give of your time generously. We ask that you strengthen your community by participating in it. You participate in your community, strengthen it, and at the same time, you strengthen our country and you educate us with regard to your culture and tradition. Now, I know you've heard all the talks that you probably want to hear today, and so now we get to the very important stage of presenting the certificates. And at this time, I would ask Ms. Tina Brown to please come forward and present the certificates. When she calls your name, I would ask that you please come, and she will issue the certificate to you. Would you like them to come this way? This way? All right. You can have all the guests speak. Yes. Down that way, Annie. Elisa Pagal Abubo. <laughs> Lester Pagal Abubo. Mi dado Alcantara Abubo. Vevelin Pagal Abubo. Farid Uden Ahmad. Also, Farid Ahmad. Umaima Farid Ahmad. Rodolfo El Faro. Mama Maram Mohammed Ansu <laughs> Mohammed Ali Ansu <laughs> Rihan Bisaiso Nazreen Munir Durrani. <laughs> Lena May Green Hansen. <laughs> Nico Insambun. Leanne Vanessa Lord. Ludmila Puchala. Diego Sanchez.
Mika Sasaki. Lawrence Kwan Yu Lee. And Han Suk Susan Lee. Let's all give our new citizens a great big round of applause. We have had an outstanding ceremony today, and I would like to ask the Van Buren High School Concert Band and its director to please stand up and receive our round of applause for their wonderful music this morning. Thank you so much, and we'd like to thank our faculty ushers and we'd also like to thank the presentation of colors. And we'd ask you to please stand. You're always so loyal to come and present the colors and do it so beautifully and make our ceremony so impressive. Please stand and let us give you a round of applause. And the father-son team is just very impressive. Thank you so much. There, it's three generations, is that correct? Outstanding. Thank you so much. You may now be seated. And I don't know if Dr. Loudon was in the room when we recognized her before. Is she here now? Dr. Loudon, please stand up and let us applaud you for this magnificent ceremony. Year after year, she and her staff put on such a wonderful ceremony. It is a joy to be here and to participate. And thank you for all the students who have come, because now you have something to look forward to. The bar is set very high by the students who spoke today. But I know you can do as well if you try. So please remember them and let them inspire you so that you can speak at the next ceremony or the ones thereafter. Is there anyone more that we neglected to recognize? Please bring it to my attention. Again, thank you all patriotic organizations, everyone who participated. We are so delighted for our new citizens. Thank you for becoming a part of our great country. We embrace you and we ask you to fully participate in all the benefits, duties, and obligations of citizenship. Thank you. Ms. Terry? This honorable court is now in recess. Please remain standing or stand for the procession of the colors.
Ladies and gentlemen, please proceed. <laughs> Thank you so much. There are two other ladies who work very hard to make this ceremony impressive and to flow smoothly. And I would like them to please come forward at this time. Ms. Annette Crawford and Ms. Tina Brown, would you please come forward so we can recognize you for all the hard work that you do, not only for this ceremony, but for each of the ceremonies. Your work is very important to the new citizens and to our country because we are bringing in many new vibrant citizens through your hard work. Thank you very much. We are now adjourned. Ms. Terry, is that correct? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Please mingle with the new citizens. If you wish to welcome them individually, please do so. And thank you so much for attending the ceremony. <laughs>